Welcome everyone to the latest CTO Craft Bites. Today we are discussing the CTO Survival Guide, how to talk with your CEO and other mysteries. We'll cover the traps and pitfalls that we've seen keeping CTOs from influencing and participating in strategy discussions, and how to use tools from the book Agile Conversations to address common executive level challenges faced by CTOs. If this is your first time at CTO Craft, let me tell you a little bit more about the group. Uh, CTO Craft is a mentoring and coaching community for technology leaders around the world, focusing on supporting technologists in their leadership growth. Community numbers are over 1,600 and provides one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring groups, an online community, and events like this one. And a huge thanks to our headline partner, AWS, for helping make these bites events possible. As you might have already spotted, CTO Craft has a conference coming up at the beginning of December. Uh, the focus will be on people, teams, and culture. And we have some amazing leaders in the lineup already, including the CTO of GitHub, VP, uh, VPs from Twitter, YouTube, Headspace, Moo, and a whole load of others. Uh, you can see more and get your tickets at the CTO uh, at, at conference.ctocraft.com, which I've already shared in the group. So introductions, uh, I'm Glenn Roberts, I'm emceeing the Byte session today, and I'm the CTO of Digital Solutions iTech Art. With me today are the two authors of Agile Conversations. So Jeffrey Frederick, who is the Managing Director at TIM, um, and Acuris Company, co-author of Agile Conversations. Jeffrey, welcome. Uh, could you give us a short introdu introduction about yourself, please? Sure. <clears throat> I'm, I'm uh, Jeff Frederick, and I've uh, been in London for about... Uh, nine years now, come here from Silicon Valley, where I've spent most of my career at uh, tool companies in a whole range of roles um, all over uh, product development uh, and uh, been uh, uh, at, uh, in London, uh, got hooked up with CTO Craft a few years ago, uh, spent some time as a CTO Craft mentor uh, for the uh, mentoring circles and uh, very excited to be uh, here talking to the CTO Craft community today. Great to have you here. And our other speaker today is Douglas Squirrel, director at Squirrel Squared, co-author of Agile Conversations. Um, Squirrel, could you get, uh, give us a short introduction about yourself as well, please? I sure can. Uh, my name is Squirrel. There are lots of people named Douglas and not many people named Squirrel, so most people call me by my surname, just to be confusing. Uh, I've been the uh, CTO at a series of startups, and now I'm what I call a transformational CTO, which means I uh, come in very quickly and work with an organization and uh, change it in a, in a very very short time and then uh, move on. And I've done that with about 101 different companies in the last uh, five and a half years, which is a load of fun and means I get to have a lot of difficult conversations, which is what we're going to talk a lot about today. And I coach people in how to do those. Uh, so uh, I've, uh, I was actually the first, I ran the first CTO craft circle, mentoring circle, uh, and then handed it over to Jeffrey and others. And uh, so I've been around with CTO Craft for a long time. And uh, likewise, glad to be talking to you guys. And I, I'm sure you have lots of interesting questions. Excellent. Well, it's great to have you both here, essentially the godfathers of CTO Craft, I like to call you. Um, <laughs> no, I'm also... True. <laughs> and I'm also very happy to obviously have the book which you've released as well, which is an excellent read. I haven't finished it yet, but it is uh, fantastic to go through. Indeed. So it's for the audience, IT revolution book. So so don't give us credit. They they they, they did all the work. <laughs> well, I also like how we, we did all the writing, but they did all the part of publishing and making it. <laughs> well, it looks awesome. Um, so for the audience with us today, you can ask your questions at any time from ask a question link below the video. So let's uh, kick off and start talking about how conversations can help you improve your effectiveness and influence as a CTO. So um, I've also added the link to uh, where to find Agile Conversations for anyone that wants to um, see the website and all the information that's available on there. We have a podcast so the podcast and free videos and all kinds of stuff. Absolutely. So the first question I've got to ask today then is, um, I know CTOs who first reaction is likely to be conversations. I'm a technologist, uh, you know, the type of people who want to focus on the technology and not the messy people bits. Um, what do you say to these people? Uh, maybe they should find a new role. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that I, I've, I think this is the uh, one of the big surprises for people when they become CTO for the first time. And of course, that's one of the issues of the CTO craft community has been very often helping people step up into that role. And uh, certainly the mentoring circles where I've had the most influence, it was often a question saying, you know, what do I do? Now, there are very different types of CTOs, but I will say, if you're the type of CTO who's going to be purely technical and not be involved with people issues, you're going to be uh, in a very um, marginal 
position and certainly not e exploiting uh, everything you can from that position. And, so and I don't I'll, like to I'll say something else as well, which is I, I don't agree with Jeffrey here. I don't think it's possible to be a CTO who doesn't involve get involved in people issues. There are CTOs who don't manage, who don't who don't have line management responsibilities. But I think you can't be at the C level in an organization, even a small organization, without having very significant uh, conversational responsibilities. Jeffrey and I might disagree about that, and you guys are welcome to ask us lots of questions about it. Well, I'll just say that, as I said, you, you, that, that I, I guarantee you that people can both be a CTO and avoid people issues. They just won't be an effective CTO. But it's, it's, a, it's a key thing here about what we're uh, one of the things that green what important words mean. But they can absolutely occupy the position and later wonder like. Well, how come the company never takes my advice? You know, how, how come I'm the CTO and yet we're not following the technical strategy I laid out? How come I'm the CTO and yet I, I no one uh, I don't have the admiration and respect of of uh, the people in the technology department? I, I claim they're <laughs> avoiding the people issues, but they still have the responsibility. We could go up down this road if uh, people are interested. So we, we won't yeah. have a, a debate. That may be a future podcast episode. So anyway, that, that's our answer for people who say I'm a technologist. We're like, well. Um, you know, it's good news and bad news. I, I'm reminded very much of the um, blog post from several years ago that I loved, which talked about someone becoming an engineering manager for the first time. And it said, it's it's not a promotion, it's a career change. So, uh, and I, I think that's true when you move into uh, engineering management for the first time, you know, you, you now, it, you're in a different profession. And I, I think that's uh, even more true when you move into an executive level position. Again, it's the executive level change is a career change. Excellent. And would you say it's the same thing for all C-level positions? So obviously like C, um, you know, chief security officers and uh, chief product officers and all those types of roles, would you consider it the same jump regardless of whether you're in the technology sector or any of the other areas of the business? I think so, absolutely. Uh, and this might be again one of the places where Squirrel and I disagree. But uh, I, I, I have a um, the idea of you know that the 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 C level executives, your first team is the executive team. It, it's um, it, and and so it's, so you've gone and, and so at that point when you become C level, you're no longer really in your professional hierarchy anymore. Yeah, you know, people think of this as as being well. I'm now the top of the technology hierarchy, and th and that may be true, but it's not the important part. The point is now you're part of the executive team, and that becomes your first team. And so that's true in all the in all the different uh, uh, functions that you've. You want you. It's very different to be the, a senior person in your function and a member of the executive. And I certainly don't disagree with that one. I, I'm often coaching CTOs in how to approach this new role or to approach the, the, the role they find themselves in. And one of the things I tell them is your first job is to go build relationships with the people in the executive team. And uh, so, for example, I, I often send them on a listening tour and I say, go find out what's important to them. But I'm not in marketing. I mean, all I need to know is what they need me to build so that they can go sell it. Why do I need to build a relationship? Well, because you're going to need marketing soon because you're in the same team and you need to understand the issues that matter to them and be helpful to them so that you have a relationship same as you would have it with people who report to you, people in your team, new hires and so on. And people who have read Five Dysfunctions of a Team uh, may have some familiarity with this sort of viewpoint. That they never, I don't recall them being explicit about that point in the, the book, but, but however, the, that is a, a, a book that many people have read and it shows uh, that the team they're dealing with there is the executive team and it and, and very much makes that point. Excellent. Okay then, so what might be a sign that I could benefit better for more agile conversations? Uh, I, I, for me, the, the, the number one um, uh, clue that I ask people to look, listen for, you know, the, the, the number one thing that people can usually sense is I just ask them, are you frustrated? <laughs> tell, tell me the most frustrating conversation uh, that you've had this week or, or in the last month. And, uh, and that's usually, for most people, there, there's, there's a, a sign that's something that, can reson that resonates with them and they can come up with something. Not always, some people claim to not be frustrated uh, and I dig a little deeper and it just turns out they're giving a different word to it. You know, it's like, well, I'm supposed to like have these emotions bottled up, but I'm not frustrated. <laughs> I just, I just accept it. And I was like, okay, really? So, so, so I have a different sign. I certainly agree with that sign. Uh, the other is to ask what conversations are you avoiding? 
So mm -hmm. are there uh, things or issues or problems that uh, you think might be helpful to resolve and it'll be good if they were figured if they were figured out if you had them uh, uh, on the table. But uh, it seems annoying to figure it out. It seems difficult. It would be threatening. You're dreading the conversation. I think that's yeah. the other type. I had one of those this morning where I uh, am working with a very, very fast growing company that um, needs to uh, you know, bring in new engineers pretty much every day. And uh, they really need to sort out um, a part of their infrastructure that will help those new engineers. And the CTO says, oh, well, that, that would mean, you know, if I went and uh, had this conversation, it might annoy the other person uh, because I'd be going and setting up this infrastructure. It might be their job. So uh, I'm not going to do that. I said, you're going to improve your relationship with this other person by having the conversation, which includes some conflict. So that uh, the fact that you're avoiding it is exactly the signal that you should go toward it. The uh, analogy I like to make is to um, uh, emergency responders. So um, if you see a firefighter or a police officer or something like that, and there's some emergency happening, our instinct is to run away from the burning car or the, um, you know, the uh, flood or whatever it is. And their instinct is to run toward it. So what you need to do is create that same instinct of, oh, there's something that is making me feel dread. I'm feeling worry. I feel like this isn't something I should do. Your instinct is then to go and do it. Absolutely. I, I just, one, one thing you, I want to clear yeah, from that uh, scroll because you mentioned the relationship and and uh, and the, the conflict. Because one thing that uh, when I talk to people about uh, the, their working relationships, I said, um, what you're looking for is to have a productive relationship which is not the same as a comfortable relationship. Uh, and generally speaking, people choose comfort <laughs> over effectiveness. Uh, and, and that's where uh, they, they end up with that sort of um, avoiding the conversation that Squirrel described. And, I've, uh, oh, go ahead, yeah. I have one other, I have one other um, symptom that occurred to me that I've been, I've been checking when people deny the uh, uh, frustration when I say, oh, that's fine. Have you, have you been in any meetings where you were bored? Uh, <laughs> because, if you're in a meeting and you're bored and one of the effective things to do in a conversation is say, look, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I feel kind of embarrassed because this is really an important topic we're discussing yet. I find myself bored and it seems to me like that something must be going wrong here. Is that something we can discuss? Yeah, Cause I guarantee you, as soon as you share with other people, the fact that you're bored, you're not going to be bored any longer. Yep. I'll, I'll, I'll tell a story related to that. And then there are a couple of really good comments in the chat. I hope you can pick up. Um, the uh, story is uh, that uh, I had a, a group, a, exactly that C-level group, in uh, an early client of mine. And the, the founder was sitting at one end of the table, and we were all sitting around uh, in the usual kind of circle around the, the, the rectangular table. And uh, one of us said, and so this new initiative, uh, we're going to be selling it in this way. So the head of sales said that. And the marketing person said, here's how we're going to market it. And the um, uh, Customer service person said, yeah, we've trained everybody in how to answer all the questions. And the tech person said, yep, we're on track to release it on Thursday. Product person says, yes, we've prioritized, we've deprioritized these items, we're all ready to go. The founder looked increasingly uncomfortable. He kept saying, oh, no, so he's the CEO, he's running the show and he's listening to us all and he seems less happy, even though we're all recording this good news. And eventually at the end, he said, not that he was bored, but he said a different emotion. He said, you know, I just can't shake it. It feels like there's something wrong with this. I can't figure out what it is. All of you just told me how great it is and we're ready to go on Thursday. I, I can't figure it out, but I, I, something bugs me. And then we went around again. And the head of sales said, well, actually, you know, I don't think anybody's going to buy it, but you guys are all building it. So I guess we should do it. And the marketing person said, yeah, I mean, I don't think there's going to be any traffic. And the customer service person said, we're really not ready because we don't understand the product yet, but we trained them as much as we can. Everybody went round, including the CTO and the head of product um, also said, you know, we're not really ready and this doesn't seem right. And we're, it's, it's, we don't think it's the right thing. And we didn't do it. But everybody in the first round was perfectly happy to say, yeah, this is working for me. This seems good. Just as in the meeting Jeffrey's imagining, it might be that everybody seems interested in, in enjoying it, but actually they're bored silly and they can't believe that they're sat there doing this useless thing. So you're going to have a much more useful conversation. It might even change the direction that you take as it did in that, uh, in that client of mine <laughs> in my early days. Absolutely. Even with like one on ones, you always get those people that you say, how are things going? Yeah, great. But then once you dig in, you find more information, you're able to get much more information out of that. So we've already got um, questions from the audience, which is excellent. So let's start um, tackling some of those. The first one I think is um, probably quite common, especially for first time CTOs. So 
how do you deal with CEOs to, to, who tell you to stick to engineering and leave business to me, especially when you are more experienced than the CEO? And how are you? And and you are seeing that the company is actually currently on a path to fail. I would suggest being more curious in that situation. So the the thing that's dangerous to me in in what that person's describing is uh, the possibility that you're uh, going to wind up with. Um, a less productive conversation because you're sure you're right. And um, you don't tend to build relationships very well when you come into them believing that you just need, all I need to do is convince you. You know, uh, uh, Clearly the company is headed the wrong direction. And uh, what I'm just gonna do is come in and convince the CEO that, uh, that I've got it right and I know the right direction. So I'd watch out for that very carefully. On the other hand, I think that that is a uh, useful topic of discussion. If somebody tells you, I think you're in engineering and you should leave me alone. First, it's a signal you might be trying to convince them, which is dangerous, but it's also a topic of conversation. So why do you think that? I'd, I'd be curious about where that reasoning came from and, and how that person came to that conclusion, because that's going to tell me something interesting. For example, that I've put them off by being too forceful, that they have had a bad experience in the past. Um, I'm going to be able to build the relationship better if I understand their point of view. I don't have to agree, but um, my instinct would be to ask a question there. Jeffrey, what do you think? Well, I, I think I agree with what you said. I just would uh, maybe um, take what you've said and, and describe the framework that we describe in the book that you're relating to. And it comes down to this fundamentally the idea of having a mutual learning conversation. And uh, that's the mindset that we want to have is a, a mutual learning mindset to have that kind of productive conversation. And mutual learning mindset basically says there might be things I don't know. There's, there's things that I do know. There's things the, the other person knows. And the productive conversation will be when we can get all of that information out and and in as part of the discussion and it's not that i will not not have any judgment i like i do have opinions and they have opinions and we we'll want to share opinions and also the the ideas and the the assumptions and the theories and the data behind that so the things that we've seen the things that you know uh, that are, are experiences that led us to our to our beliefs and in the end there's no uh, there's no way that you can take two people in the world and say, given a, any given topic, that we're going to have a way to get them to agreement. But we do think there's a way that you can re regularly and really get to a point of mutual understanding. And in our experience, that mutual understanding is usually enough. <laughs> uh, and in fact, many of the times that when you, on the path to, to mutual understanding, as you start learning the other people's experiences, what led them to their to, to their point of view, um, and, and you're both learning, that's the mutual learning part, that you often do end up with a, agreement, maybe not agreement in every detail, but maybe agreement about what to do next. Uh, and and we'll I'll say this, even if you don't, even if at the end you, you, you have discussed it all out and you understand each other's positions and you don't agree, well, you know what? You're no worse off. In fact, I'd say you're better off because you 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 know exactly where you stand, and you're in a better position to make a decision about what to do next. So, in the case of the of the CEO and CTO and and difference, maybe you learn that there's something uh, useful that you uh, uh, that you don't have and uh, didn't know about this person, or maybe you learn a lot and you um, make a better uh, informed decision about what you want to do next, which might be uh, you know that you don't think you can work with CEO. So any outcome is possible, but whatever outcome you're gonna make, you're gonna be in a better position to make that decision. So that's my taking what Squirrel said, I agree with every word of it, and then to, to relate to the book, here's the framework uh, to interpret it. And everything else we're gonna say is pretty much follows from the same, uh, you know, this is, you've just you've just got all the value of the book, not, not really, there's a lot more. In the book, we tell you about how to actually develop this mindset, which is the hard part. Awesome. And on the chat, you know, we already mentioned in group think. Um, so one of the questions from the audience as well is um, to build on the group think at a C-suite level, how do you shift the conversation from agreeing with the status quo to challenging status quo? Well, I, I think the, the, the um, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward, but the, 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 and the first step is the idea of um, making the undiscussable discussable, right? Finding those things that are uncomfortable. We, we did a uh, podcast, uh, I can't remember if it was last week that we put it out. I think it was last week, Squirrels, that, that with um, a woman who's a consultant, and I just love the name of her consulting company, which is Liberated Elephant, which is like, there's the elephant in the room and you need to free that elephant, like let it, get it, don't don't keep it caged up. Make, so discussing those, those kind of elephant in the room, and the one to start with is, uh, you know what, I, I just wanna say, uh, 
I don't think that we are always up front. I don't think we always have the productive conflict among the executive team that we should have. I think that we could have more productive conflict and I would like to, and, uh, and I intend to. <laughs> so if there are things that I, that I uh, disagree with, I'm gonna raise them here and it's not intended to be a personal attack. It's intended to uh, be a, a step towards us at making better decisions. And I will also invite you to uh, critique what I'm saying. I, I, what I, I want us, and this goes back to what I said earlier, we don't want to have a comfortable relationship with each other. We want to have a productive relationship. And that will sometimes, that should mean disagreeing. Uh, and, and, and I often will tell people that if you're, um, the, we, we, we all claim that the value of a team is that diverse opinions, which means what we say is we want difference of opinion. We want disagreement. And, uh, and so it, it, usually people are, uh, easily persuaded that this is the right thing to do. And then it's just a question of taking steps to make that a practice. Uh, and the thing I'd add to that, again, agree with Jeffrey's uh, analysis. I would start with something else though. I'd, I'd ask, why does this person want to um, shift the, the, the discussion on, into challenging the status quo? And, and it, I would be looking to share that. So that I was talking about tr curiosity before, I'd be looking for transparency here. If you just say, hey, we should challenge the status quo, <laughs> it's very hard for somebody else why? to follow. <laughs> yeah, why? Yeah. Why do you want to do that? So I'd share much more about the reasoning for why you want to do that and make sure that that's something that is discussable with the other people in the conversation. So you might, for example, say, look, our sales are slipping. And I, I think there are some things that we ought to be looking at changing. And if we just keep turning the crank, uh, we're going to be overtaken by competitors. Do other people see it that way or differently? And you might learn something new that would change that point of view for you if you're able to uh, be transparent about that uh, motivation. Uh, it'll be easier for others to follow than, as Jeffrey says, the, um, uh, the, the um, uh, statements that you're making um, because those are simply actions. Those are conclusions that you're drawing. If you can share the reasoning that went into those uh, uh, those actions and those conclusions, you're going to get further and also possibly disconfirm them, which is always very helpful. And I'll think, I think from, from my own experience and from <clears throat> talking to others, the first thing that they disconfirm is the idea that everyone else is content with the status quo. <laughs> that it, And uh, it, generally speaking, uh, uh, there's a lot of people who are discontent and what they lack is an effective path forward towards discussing it and coming up with a plan for change. It's sort of like, well, things aren't perfect, but they're not perfect anywhere. And, you know, so I guess we just make do the best we can and we'll just kind of muddle along, which is for me, that is absolutely group think in action and incredibly common, the most common uh, uh, dysfunction that I find. And I'll, I'll remind everybody of um, uh, something that you can read about more in the book, which is a uh, experiment that kind of shows this groupthink in the in the most uh, memorable way. So you won't you won't forget this experiment once you've heard about it. Uh, the uh, experimenters, and this has been repeated many times, so it's not um, had, had difficulty in in replication as lots of other psychological studies have. You uh, get a group of people in a room. And uh, you don't uh, tell them what they're doing. They have them fill in a questionnaire or something that you don't really care about. And then uh, th through a vent in the wall, you start sending smoke into the room. And you then watch what happens. And if, if, if instead of a group, you have just one person, that person pretty quickly says, smoke in the room. Doesn't seem very good. Leaves, goes and finds somebody and says, hey, maybe the building's burning down. In a group, that doesn't happen. In fact, if you watch, you can watch videos of this. Uh, th there are people who will sit in there until they're coughing and choking. Um, they might open a window um, in order to try to make it a little more nice for them, but they won't go get anybody. So uh, I'm, I'm, uh, as Jeffrey memorably put it to me once, uh, they, people would rather die in a fire than um, uh, go and uh, confront some difficult situation and say, hey, wait a minute, guys, we might be on fire here. There's something going wrong here. Because they look around and they see everybody else is busy filling in the questionnaire and everyone reinforces everyone else. <laughs> That's a great story. Um, okay, so just while we're still talking about this groupthink um, process, um, is there, so I assume the group thing concept um, works better when you're actually building on um, diversity and inclusion of other members of the team as well, which is why it works so well. 
um, it certainly helps to have those elements. So if you have more diverse um, perspectives, uh, then you have a chance of getting participation and avoiding groupthink. Um, but you can still fall into other uh, difficult situations, and you can certainly have groupthink just as much in a, in a more diverse group. They, they can be just as intimidated. So when you do this psycho psychology experiment, you can do it with different groups of people or, or have quite different approaches, and they'll all sit there uh, happily filling in their questionnaire. So it's a necessary condition if you want to get um, uh, more diverse points of view and ideas and, and thoughts out, but it, it doesn't produce the, uh, just having the diversity in the room doesn't produce the outcome. Yeah, no, it's actually worse than that. I've sat, sadly to say, uh, I was at um, DevOps Enterprise Summit a few weeks ago, and there was a discussion there talking about d diversity in groups and the value of it. But it also made the point that if you look at the data, that less diverse groups um, more quickly uh, are, are more likely to overcome uh, the, and, and develop trust uh, to the point that they start being vulnerable. <laughs> uh, uh, it doesn't always happen, but it's but it's statistically more likely, and it makes sense. So the, the the problem here is that whenever we see a potential for a threat or embarrassment, our uh, instinct is to hold back, and that's what leads to groupthink. And when we go into a place where there's more diversity, we actually feel less comfortable, less sure of ourselves. We're 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 less able to predict how other people will react, and um, that's the that's the function of diversity. Like. These people are different from me. They think differently than I do. I'm not sure how they will take what I'm going to say. Maybe they have different opinions. And rather than seeing it as an opportunity, like, yay, people who think differently from me, this is going to be great. Let's go Let's go get our opinions out there. Let's go find those differences. We, we hold back. We're like, oh, wait, maybe they think smoke is good. <laughs> maybe, maybe they like the smoke. I don't know. I, I don't want to offend anyone by, you know, uh, bringing up smoke when maybe that's a sensitive issue for them. So we end up not, we end up, uh, uh, the, the fundamental problem is this: we we lack the skill uh, to take advantage of the diversity of our opinion, and so even then, when we make the opportunity for that richer, we're less effective. And this, we go back to like why we started here, scrolling and, and coming today. Part of it, we wanted to frame what we were going to talk about, and we talked about you know we know this is CTOs, and we wanted to focus on this executive level issue, in part because. This is where very often people start having trouble in their career because suddenly they are with people who are different. They don't have the same background. They don't have the same experiences. You can't rely on the technical uh, commonality. They probably and, don't know how to spell Kubernetes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one knows how to spell Kubernetes. Anyway, that's uh, exactly. And, and, and so that leads to a lot of the dysfunction that, and that CTOs struggle with. Now, first of all, the executive teams often struggle independently of the CTO. <laughs> However, I, op I often winding up wind up coaching the entire leadership team. Jeffrey does too, I think, when we're when we come exactly, in to do this kind of thing. Right. Yep. So it's so so we will we'll coach people other than CTOs, but I, I think CTOs feel m more fish out of water than others because they, they that technical div division does feel like a bit of a divide, and that makes it m more difficult for them to engage uh, um, in in the in the conversation that needs to be happening which is the executive team saying, well, what are we gonna do? <laughs> what is our strategy? Is this possible? Are we actually gonna make this happen? What are the obstacles that prevent us from succeeding? Like these are really important fundamental questions that the executive team should be engaging with as a team. And yet so often they're, they're just anemic versions of the conversations that could happen. And to be clear, when it's difficult conversations in the executive team, those difficult conversations are magnified the further you go down in the org chart. Right, so when you're unable to have productive collaboration uh, in the executive suite, then you're going to find, you know, conflict or even disdain between the functions lower level, the the technologists and the product people and the business people, and it just it's it's a mess. But it, 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 to me, it, it originates in the relationships in the executive circle. Yeah, absolutely. So the next question also lines up with my questions quite nicely as well. So you call out talking with the CEO as part of the CTO survival guide. Why does the CEO get special billing? So like in my mind, when I when I talk about talking to the CEO, I talk about managing upwards. Mm -hmm. I assume that you might disagree with that terminology. So I'd love to hear your opinion. Um, yeah. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Well, I was saying, well, I, 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 I will start with this, which is I mean, earlier I said there's the, you know, we are... Um, inhibited when there's a potential for threat or embarrassment. And with the CEO is where you will have the highest potential for threat or embarrassment. 
and so it is the most uh, uh, difficult relationship to be productive in, to have productive conflict to start with. That's one thing. And the second thing is, and I'm seeing this as someone who's been CEO, uh, it is um, the CEO position can be a very lonely position. And it's very hard for CTOs, for other people to have empathy up the ladder. You talk about, then actually you use a great phrase, managing upwards. Effective, doing that effectively, I, I, I do, that phrase does make me cringe a bit because it because it feels like like we're gonna use partial information here and I, that's not, that I wouldn't, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm, I'm gonna put that aside for a minute. To, to be effective, what you really want is partner upwards. You, and, and that means understanding what that person values. And it's and this is kind of the key thing. It's really essential that the CEO believes that you are on the same team, that they know that you're on the same team, that you demonstrate that you're on the same team. And the way you do that is through a conversation where you can say back to them, here's the things I think you are worried about. Here's the things I think that you are concerned about. Am I right? And you test your understanding when they when you can say back to them, like what they see as the biggest concerns and they go, that's right. Then you're, you're onto something. By the way, that, that's, that, that's right test. Uh, a very good articulation that came in the, um, uh, in the book, uh, uh, never split the difference. And the, the, uh, uh speaker has, uh, uh, I heard him uh, doing a, a, a talk, uh, watching some YouTube video and he really emphasizes this uh, idea of empathy empathy that it's, it's only when you are talking to the person and they say back to you, not your right, that's not what you want to hear. You don't want to hear you're right. You want to hear that's right. Then you know that you've really represented accurately what they feel. And from that point on, once the CEO believes that you are on the same team, you're going to have a much better working relationship. And I would say really before that, if the CEO does not have evidence that you're on the same team, it makes sense they don't listen to you. It makes sense that they don't trust you. Why should they take your word for it if you haven't demonstrated that you understand the most important things for the business? And if and, and, and demonstrating, again, means you say it out loud. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what you hold in your heart of hearts. It doesn't matter what you go do. If they don't hear it from you, if they don't have evidence that you're on the same team, you're going to be held in a position of suspicion at best. So I'll just add that uh, the the book Never Split the Difference is by a, a, a hostage negotiator, right, Jeffrey? He's uh, I've actually right. read it. He's, he's uh, so he deals uh, with FBI lead uh, hostage negotiator for several years. Yep, and so so it's very helpful in those situations, which are, which are much worse than the ones we're likely to be in. I doubt yeah. your CEO is holding anyone hostage. Maybe your maybe your server budget, but you know, he's that not depends on the business any, model. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not holding any people <laughs> hostage, probably. But um, in those situations, which are much more fraught than the ones we're in, the the building of trust and the the that's right test and and um, seeing that you're on the same team is is super important and works. So you might not think that you, as a hostage negotiator, you would want to be on the same team as the person holding the hostages, but you do want that kind of empathy and you want that level of understanding. So your CEO is a lot easier. CEO is gonna, not going to be as as challenging as uh, as, as a someone you're uh, uh, who, who's holding hostages. So uh, that that should at least give you some hope that if uh, you're able to do it in that uh, very dangerous, very fraught situation, that maybe you can do it in the boardroom. Uh, maybe you can do it uh, uh, on on Zoom when you when you phone up the CEO. Uh, I've got one example of this that's uh, top of mind for me right now. I'm doing uh, a, a webinar in a couple of weeks for a, a group of CFOs. Uh, and I'm talking to them, and I was just writing it up this morning uh, about how to uh, interpret what technology people tell them. And the experience they have, the reason they're excited about this topic is they go into board meetings and um, uh, uh, look at uh, um, packs of materials for investors and so on, and they get um, burn up charts from us. They get um, uh, descriptions of story points or velocity, or uh, they get, uh, I saw others that were like, uh, um, uh, I, I couldn't even describe how um, confusing some of these metrics are. They're very, very technical. Not, you know, number of uh, uh, server instances purchased last month, this sort of thing. They need to hear from you in their language. So that kind of, um, you're, you're not gonna get a that's right on, uh, uh, hey, uh, I'm thinking of migrating into AWS. They're gonna say AW who? It's not gonna be meaningful uh, to, to a non-technical person in the rest of the business. What's valuable is to use their language. And that means you might need to learn stuff like how to read a balance sheet. 
Sorry, um, <laughs> but um, read a, books on this. You can go read a few. It's actually not that difficult. It's a heck of a lot easier than uh, deciphering somebody's weird uh, Python release script or, or Terraform uh, uh, configuration or something. Uh, so it's actually decipherable. But if you can talk about uh, EBITDA, and um, uh, return on investment and um, uh, cost savings and so on. If you talk in language that's meaningful to the person you're speaking to, you're much more likely to get that that's right response. Absolutely. And yeah, I do love uh, Never Split the Difference book. Uh, Chris Voss is very interesting. But uh, essentially, I think there's still probably some contrast between your book and theirs because their negotiation book is about trying to get to an end, end point. And yes, some of it is building empathy and relationship, um, which obviously does match with your guys. But obviously, he's got very much an end game in mind, which doesn't well, always align to that. that. That's kind of exactly. important. Yeah, absolutely. Where, whereas we, we'd be really happy if you discovered something new. If I came and talked to you about EBITDA and, and the, the cost savings and you said, that's right. And then I said, well, gee, what if we did this differently, different than when I what I had when I came in? That would be a good outcome for us. Um, uh, but that's unlikely to be as, as valuable in the hostage negotiation situation. Absolutely. So um, what specifically in the Agile Conversations book would actually help CTOs with their conversations with their actual CEO? Well, I think there's there's a, a number of elements. So just I'll say a bit about the structure of the book, um, uh, which we haven't talked about in great detail. Um, the, the book is structured in, in two parts. Uh, and part one uh, is, a, is, is just two chapters. And in there, we give a bit of the history of um, agile, lean, uh, DevOps, digital transformation type thing. Essentially, the why uh, that make the case that all of these methodologies, all their breakthroughs, were really uh, funds around people at, at the core. There was there was different processes, but one of the elements they that they did is they elevated. Um, uh, humans and human values, uh, as opposed to kind of the Taylorist model, which was, um, and, and if you want to know what that means, you know, read the book. But anyway, so I moved from Taylorism towards more people-centric um, ways of interactions, and and say, look, if you're going to deal with humans, the the way that you the the, the way that you interact with humans comes down to conversations, and that means it's worth developing your conversational skill. And we introduce that a, a bit then in the. Uh, in in the, the next chapter, we talk about some of the foundations of what we just described, mutual learning, the need to be transparent and curious. And for the remainder of the book, we then start applying to more specific elements, which we say are the five conversations that you need to have a, a high pro, high uh, a high performing team. And um, uh, they're the trust conversation, the fear conversation, uh, the why uh, conversation, commitment conversation, and accountability conversation. Whew, I wasn't sure I was going to get all those in the right in the right order. You're usually uh, the one who gets them right, Jeffrey. So I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I'm glad I was here to help, but glad you remembered. Great. So you have those conversations, and we we talk about kind of what the elements are that annex those conversations, and we also give it for each one. We give particular tools to use to help make those conversations go better. Uh, overall, the whole book has the message that look, these are skills. Skills require practice. You you can't understand your way into a skill, and and I use the example of the piano. Yeah, hey I Jeffrey, can... I'm going to go watch some YouTube videos after this, and and after I watch the YouTube videos, I'll understand exactly how pianos work, and yeah. then I'm going to be a concert pianist. What what do you yeah. think of my chances? I, I I I unless unless you've already done a lot of practice before you understand, the understanding won't help you. Uh, uh, so that so there's a, it's the book here is to provide. Um, not just some understanding, but also actual exercises for people to do to build those skills. And so I think that's the idea of the of how the book can help someone in these conversations is they give them different frameworks to diagnose what's going wrong, gives them things to practice uh, uh, to and, and both in the conversations and also outside, you know, how to build my skill between uh, performances. That's really important. You know, you do, the, the concert pianists don't only practice on stage, you know, that's the performance they they practice to be ready for it. So to tell you as we had to be preparing, diagnosing the conversations, because really I, there's a there's a really kind of weird psychological insight. And, and this is, I think, for me, the most interesting part. We would all be much better at conversations if we actually knew what we said. But the problem is the way our psychology works, we actually don't know what we say. And, and people here, they, uh, they might not believe me, and I'm, just, I'm not going to try to prove it right now. The science backs me up. You actually don't know what you see in a conversation. 
And part of the biggest trick to what we do is we give you these four R's, this sort of methodology, this process to help you start learning to see what you're actually saying, to see what your behavior actually is. And once you understand actually basically how terrible your conversational skills are, the uh, improvement will come pretty readily. And I just want to point out there's a fascinating um, exchange in the comments, which fits perfectly with what we've just been talking about. Um, uh, the, the exchange goes, uh, uh, Pablo says, uh, uh, I don't like when the company hides the numbers from me. Um, and uh, Thomas says, uh, well, it's a lack of trust. And then uh, uh, um, someone comes back. I can't see where it's now scrolled off the screen, but um, uh, CFO presented numbers and I could talk back to them and then they talk to me differently. So a perfect example of building <laughs> trust by uh, being able to step outside, as someone else said here, the, the comfort zone, uh, participate and join with the other person in the conversation that's meaningful to them. And then they treat you differently and, and interact differently with you. So uh, we, we give a whole bunch of techniques for how to practice that and how to get to it. Um, sounds like you guys are uh, already practicing it here in the chat, which is great, or, or telling stories of having done so. Great. Um, so going from the other side of things, what advice would you give to CEOs on how they should actually talk to their CTOs? Um, Scroll, do you want to you want to go first on this? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I, I, the same. Long <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't think it's going to be very long. It's just going to be exchange the E's and the T's and um, uh, uh, learn some uh, technical knowledge that, that might be helpful. You don't have to be able to spell Kubernetes, but you know, it would help you to uh, have, have some understanding of what's important to the technologically minded person you're trying to collaborate with and uh, have the same kinds of conversations. So uh, yeah, as, as Jeffrey said, I don't think it's got a long answer because it's uh, uh, more or less uh, the mirror image of the of the first one. Although I, I don't know that I, I don't think I have any interest actually in a CEO understanding the technology when we talk. I, I feel like we should be able to talk about the, that any 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 technical issue is going to have a business ramification that we can talk about. If 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 if, my, if the CEO needs to understand any bit of technology for us to have an effective conversation, I, I would feel like I failed. So I think I I disagree with you on that on that point. I don't want the CEO to feel like they need to learn technology. I'm not sure they need to, but the, the question was, how, how could they do it better? So I'd be looking for ways to build trust. And build Listening and understanding. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when they don't say, you know, I think the, the, the question is, well, can you can you help me understand how that applies to the business? Like I, being good at asking questions. I, I think it's very easy to let someone make a statement that you don't understand and to let it go and be thinking, like, I don't understand how it's relevant. And because it, it's very threatening to say, you know, scroll that thing you just said. I, I, I think I heard you say this. So I hear that right. Yes. Okay. You know, the thing is, I don't really understand how it's responsive to what I asked. I asked you the question that was like X, Y, and Z, and then you told me this thing like, you know, that seems like an answer from Pluto. I, 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 I can you help me understand how you see the connection? Um, I, I think that it's more about having that sort of um, active listening, like actually listening to people, which. I think that's the that's the the number one conversational skill to start with, actually listening to the other person, and then uh, um, inquiring into the parts that aren't clear for you. Can you, you know what was you, what? How did you make this connection? Because I I'm not following. Okay, and one of the next questions from the audience um, just goes from um, well, I should take the assumption from a CTO level down if you're in a large organization, in a world where software is eating the world, how do the C-suite as a team get more ownership of IT concerns? So I can imagine this occurring if you're coming into a business where you're um, the previous person that role well, didn't feel that he had to be, um, you know, understand everything. So therefore, there's more independent entities with inside that organization. So therefore, they haven't been communicating effectively and obviously still have that mindset at this stage. So what would be your advice in this stage? I'm having trouble following I, the question. I think Jeffrey might be able sorry, to. So yeah, let me run it through again. So in a world where oh, software Jeffrey, is Jeffrey, are, are you ready for that one? Yeah, I, I might. Well, I'll say this: if I, if let me test my understanding here, and you is that um, I, I kind of, I kind of hearing this question through the lens of the Phoenix Project, um, which uh, um, is, uh, you know, that that uh, or digital transformation. You know, uh, software is changing all the businesses, <laughs> basically. Every business is becoming a digital business, and uh, that's what it means by software is eating the world. Uh, and what that means is that there's a there's a real um, now convergence of uh, technical opportunities and business problems, and and that's been the change. So prior that you could have your 
uh, traditional organization. And there might be some, you know, technical enablement done. You know, so maybe the files you used to carry around are now done on a file server, you know, or, or uh, um, you know, on SharePoint or something like that. But really, there hadn't been really a change of process. There wasn't kind of a, you know, digital first solution. Um, there wasn't really a way of saying, how could technology change what we offer? How could technology change how we operate? And the, the companies that are able to be more creative about that, more innovative, you know, that, that are more expansive, will you know, eat the world uh, uh, in that way. The, 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 uh, and so, the, so my, this is how, this is the lens I'm hearing that com that question. Now, if someone who asked that, if I got it wrong, please let us know in the chat or a follow up question. Um, so it was my, it's because I was saying this, in this world, to me, this is what drives the need for collaboration. This is why the uh, value of effective collaboration between the technology side of the business and the rest of the business, or I just say this, all of the functions to be uh, um, and that, uh, technology in there is is crucial now in a way that really wasn't in the past because in the past it was quite possible to be um, to have you know kind of um, as long as you had your IT technical enablement in place that was good enough there, there it was really just like an, a, a, an extension of the status quo not a not a real sea change and and now you know change is coming and. Uh, you know, like winter is coming, the, ch the change is coming. And the, the, the people who succeed are the ones that are able to establish those relationships to find out what's possible. And the, the, the people who, who aren't able to have that uh, kind of collaboration, uh, they'll likely fail. Uh, I'm reminded of uh, a bit of history, if, if nobody minds a brief history lesson. And uh, the person, Xavier, who asked the question says, we got it right. So it sounds like we're on the right track. So I'll, I'll expand. Excellent. Um, I'm reminded of uh, when people went from steam engine powered factories to electricity powered factories. And mm. if I understand it right, I may get some of these details wrong. I would love to be corrected. Um, steam engine powered factories had a single steam engine and it would drive a single wheel and that yep. would cause a single set of things to happen and there was all kind of coordinates kind of one big machine belts. Me mechanical belts to establish every you know connect to all the uh, drive the power throughout the whole factory and if you turned off the central um energy then then the whole thing would stop and um they all had to run in sync because you had one source and they all ran together um, whereas when you got electricity you could plug them all in like we plugged in the computers we're all using to talk to each other right now if i unplug my computer it doesn't unplug jeffrey's we, we all run separately on electricity that's natural to us now, but it wasn't then. And um, it, it uh, what must have been a, a, a shift, I, I don't have evidence for this, but I have to believe it was, that people had to shift from, uh, I'm now dependent on you, and when, your is, when yours is running, I also have to be running, to the idea that actually we can have independent stations, and that we can run separately, and that we can, um, we'll need to collaborate more in order to make sure that you know that you've got your machine on, and you're sending widgets down to me that I need to paint blue, or whatever it is. Uh, rather than, uh, okay, switch on the whole factory and we all need to do our things in, in coordination. So um, that, that shift, it's that kind of shift of um, instead of uh, um, uh, one, one bit being um, uh, kind of enabling the whole thing, we now have many independent pieces, which needs an awful lot more collaboration and coordination. So one of the questions from the audience that's got the most votes at the moment is mm. um, how can we ask other executives if they understand what we're saying without sound, sounding condescending? Well, Lynn, can I just can I just check uh, that I understand this correctly? <laughs> um, I, I, actually, the the, the the way I would say it is like this. Um, you know, I, I just said this thing, and I'm and I'm worried that I wasn't very clear. And I'd really like to test that everyone understands, but I'm also nervous that I was gonna come across as condescending. Um, so I'm gonna risk that anyway, because I think it's important. Was someone here willing to say back to me what you think I said? And, or if you think you're not able to, let me know and I, I can try again. And, and can you tell me, did, did you think it was condescending? Cause that wasn't my intent. Sure, yeah. Cool. Well, that sounds like that would work. So that sounds awesome. <laughs> but, but notice how difficult that is to do. So Jeffrey just produced that. It seemed effortlessly. That, that's the result of uh, many years of practice. That's that's very, very hard to do to actually get it to come out of your mouth. And that's why we say it's so important to do things like uh, we have this concept of a conversational dojo. You can get if you go to conversationaltransformation.com, you'll find information about uh, how to do that. And a, a dojo kit you can download and stuff like that. 
that's a place where you can practice. Um, Jeffrey runs them, uh, so you can go on to a, a meetup that he runs and, and practice this kind of um, speech because it doesn't come naturally. You don't think to yourself, uh, gosh, now it's the time for me to explain that I'm worried and uh, concerned and I might be condescending. Yeah. That just doesn't come naturally to you in a situation where you're already feeling nervous and dreading the um, uh, the outcome. You're, that's where you shut down or you talk a lot in order to cover what you uh, aren't saying or use a lot of technical jargon rather than say, you know, I'm worried I might be condescending and that's not my intent. Is that how I'm coming across to you? And this is this is exactly what uh, Squirrel described earlier, which is you know um, developing the instincts to run towards the danger, and that's because that's exactly what I did. I just sort of like I'm having this thought uh, that this is my concern, and then developing the instinct to say, well, if this is my concern, I can share it, like and and I'm gonna I'm gonna share the problem, and share my reasoning, be transparent, and um, and then see what comes out of it. Okay. Uh, and what, whatever whatever happens next, it will. Uh, this is more comfortable, but the outcome will be better than if I hadn't done it. <clears throat> Wonderful. Uh, and the next question is actually on the message chat as well. So it's from Josh. Um, hey, guys, how do you communicate effectively with CEOs who have a tendency to be a bit overreaching? For example, challenging of the technical um, Mushia? Uh, first, you, you give him a hug because I'm so glad that there's mm. a CEO who wants to be involved. That, that sounds like a great start. Um, it, it is challenging, and I have a lot of uh, uh, CTOs I coach who are in exactly this situation, especially when the CEO used to be the CTO or, or was the technical leader before the CTO was hired and has trouble letting go. So that's a common problem, but, and it is an important problem, which we'll talk about in a second. But I just want to note how good a problem it is because it's, it's um, helpful. It's a great place to start that the, CTO, the CEO is engaging. It's a much more difficult problem, still a solvable problem in the ways that we've been talking about when that CEO comes along and, and says, well, I just don't understand that tech stuff. So, um, you know, here's some budget and I hope you figure it out and uh, I'm going to go sell some more. That doesn't give you as much of a place to start. Whereas if the CEO is always in your face saying, uh, hey, what's that, that Cooper, whatever it is, and, and why aren't you using more of it? And I just read about it uh, on Instagram yesterday about how good uh, that Terraform is. So you should be using it. That's help a helpful place to start, even though it's painful because you've got a conversation going. You've got something to respond. You've got something to bite on. Jeffrey, did you want to say more about this one or should I try to, to say then how you solve the problem once you've got it? Uh, well, uh, the, the, I'm just, I'm, I'll, I'll leave that, that space. I'll just leave one little element in here just because the, the um, it, it connects to my mind potentially to that issue I said earlier of um, being on the same team with the CEO. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in my view, it's sort of um, understanding their motivation in doing that. So um, I'll, I'll let you talk through it, but that just, that's the one element that came to mind for oh, me. Absolutely, and that was where I was headed. So the thing I yeah. would want to do is to be curious, and this would be a place where I'd, I'd, I'd use my curiosity and, and build some trust with the person. To, uh, my question would be, um, you, you're telling me a lot of very detailed technical information here. This is great, I'm, I'm interested in talking about it with you, but before we do that, can you help me with why you're, you're bringing that to me? That's unusual and I'd like to understand it better. And um, you're likely to find out about things like fear. I'm afraid that you uh, won't be using the latest technology, and I want to know that you will. Trust. Um, uh, I, I'm not confident that you'll be doing the right things. And I want to check on it. Um, uh, misalignment. So it may be that uh, the founder or the CEO thinks that uh, um, you are not headed in the direction that he or she thinks is most important. And Jeffrey was saying it before, they need to hear that you're on the same team. So this may be their way of finding out that you're on the same team. Could be other motivations too, but I'd like to understand that first. And then that gives me something that is um, both what I think is happening and discussable. So, so it may be, you know, I was hypothesizing before that a common motivation is that um, the CEO used to be the CTO, used to have a very technical role and has hired the new CTO. In that situation, it's very natural to, uh, here's the fancy name for it, uh, to make an attribution to say that must be the motivation. And your brain is really good. And there's a whole section in the book on this. Your brain is extremely good at taking that coherent story and believing it's absolutely true. And what's most useful is to confirm it because two good things happen. You say, gee, I think it might be that you uh, used to have this role and you're asking me questions about it because you kind of miss it and you want to check in with me on it. Is that true? Because one of two good things happens. Either, no, actually, that's not the issue at all. 
I'm so glad I don't have to think about this stuff anymore. And if I, I never have to say the word Kubernetes again, I'll be happy. But I don't trust you because we, we've had outages for the past five days. And, and I'm really worried that it's not working. Then you know there's a different issue and you can work on that one. And your coherent story has been busted, has been broken up. On the other hand, it maybe they confirm it and they say, yeah, that's exactly right. How did you know? And then you say, well, this is something we can now discuss and that I can bring up in the future. You know, like we agreed before, this seems like it might be one of those times where you're you're kind of pining for the, the coding you used to do and you're, you're bringing me some issues. That's great. I'm happy about it. But we, we also talked about how that might be interfering with me and I'm feeling that that's the case. Is, is that right? Is this another of those circumstances that we talked about before? And now you have it discussable instead of it being the coherent story in your head that you've never shared. So that's, that's how I would attack that one is by um, understanding the motivation and making it discussable and then uh, dealing with the issues that that brings up, whether that's trust or accountability or um, fear. Okay. And excellent. This falls on nicely to the next question from an audience, which would be another example, which is obviously an interesting way to try and tackle a challenge they're experiencing. Um, for this user, I've always tried to strive for um, psychological safety in the way you guys have described, but it's but it has been perceived as a weakness in the C-suite. What do I do? And they also gave another example of what the outcome is, uh, or oh, it's wasted everybody's time. We need to keep to the agenda. Let's solve this offline. Um, so obviously I can imagine that coming up a few times with the way that you talk, you know, some people less attuned would see this as a weakness rather than as a strength. Um, what is your view and approach in situations like this? Jeffrey, did you want uh, that one? Uh, one thing I'll just say is that the actual, the actual response is going to be very situational and because um, we, we can give kind of general diagnostic approaches you know they're, they're kind of entries but the but the, the reality is that every situation is different you know the humans are different humans have amazing capability for variety much more than we give them credit for there's many more stories in people's heads out there than we could ever imagine um and, and so the, the the really the um the, to me it's really comes down to specifics uh one thing i would say is um uh, psychological safety if you recall for people is the belief that um uh, uh, everyone, everything that everyone says is being said to, for the good of the collective outcome, and that anything you say will be interpreted as though it was intended for the good of the collective outcome. So there's, there's this sort of uh, a, a mutual feeling that anything I say will be seen as the be in the best possible light, and I will interpret other people's behavior in the best possible light. And the reason that you want psychological safety is for people to express their differences, to, to have that conflict productively. And the goal is high performance. And for me, that's that's always the starting point when I have conversations with people about, about any of these techniques about why I want them is, look, I, I want us to be better. <laughs> and and if you want to introduce it, then, well, what's the situation where, you know, it's going to be situational. Why are you introducing it? Um, for me, uh, at at Tim, where where I introduced this, you know, as it is a em employee uh, a few years ago when I was CTO, uh, I said, you know, I I think we would have better outcomes if we uh, have all the information on the table. Does that? And I think that that sometimes means if there's disagreement, we want to hear that. You know, how do you feel about that? Uh, it's to the CEO, <laughs> and th their answer was, of course, because. Of course, everyone wants this, you know, when you frame it in terms of, don't we want to hear difference of opinion? And if they say no, then I'd be like, okay, well, when there are differences, how, how would you see us resolving them? You know, if people do feel differently, so I understand, so maybe someone says, you know, I do understand that you want to keep those meetings on time. That's great to know that we want to keep to that agenda. If there are situations where people disagree, how would you see them getting resolved? You know. I'm, as soon as I don't need to, to challenge your position of wanting to keep the agenda, to keep keeping to the agenda, that's fine. But do we have a shared interest in um, uh, in, in uh, discussing these? And if so, now I can share the problem. How are we going to accomplish that? <laughs> I'm I'm open to other views. My position is I would like to have it discussed in that meeting. But if that conflicts with your position of keeping in time, that's fine. My real interest is not discussing the meeting. My just interest is discussing it at all. How do we how do we have those conversations? So sharing sharing the problem, uh, finding the the point of common interest, and then sharing the problem is 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 a generic approach for me. 
Awesome. Okay, so as we are just coming to the end now, so as we're coming to like the end of an hour, let's just quickly round up with a very hopefully easy question. Um, what is going to be the hardest part of applying what we've talked about today? Uh, well, there's this very difficult thing you need to do, and and I'm I'm sorry that I'm going to give everybody this very difficult assignment, but um, it, it it it's going to require some special materials, and you're going to need to uh, perform this very particular action. What you do is you take a piece of paper, and I'll just make one with my hands here, and um, what you need to do is fold it in half. This is the the complicated technical part of the um, of the work. And once you fold it in half, then you write on the left hand side what you were thinking during a conversation. And on the right hand, only you, you can't write what someone else is thinking. And on the right hand side, you write what uh, you and the other person said, as best you remember. You don't have to get it exactly right. If you go and do that action, and of course, the book tells you all about how to do it in lots of detail um, and lots of exercises you can do with it, even just doing that action will give you a huge amount of practice and material to work on. Even if you just take one sheet of paper, you don't need more than one and write the, the key part of the conversation that didn't go well. And you have a picture there, which is fantastic, <laughs> excellent. That's slightly more neat than, and, and typeset than you need to be. Um, but you need actual paper or an actual screen. It needs to be outside your head. It can't be inside your head. And you imagine that you're uh, pretending to fold the paper. You need the actual paper, the actual screen on which, don't fold your screen, uh, the actual uh, place where you're gonna be putting things in two columns. Um, there's lots of, uh, psychology behind why you need to do it that way and why that's valuable, which we don't have time for. The, uh, the, the crucial thing and the thing that is actually the hardest is sitting down to do that. And you'll find this huge psychological barrier to doing it and then this huge benefit after you do it. Which is one of the reasons we push the, the, the dojo uh, approach because it's the difference between you know knowing that you should exercise and then being in, in an exercise class with other people. And, and it, it's just easier to do the work when you've Going up with people, uh, whether that's one ones that would like to organize publicly, or whether you're doing it with with uh, colleagues or friends, you know, uh, to to practice um, that group practice is it really um, makes that it much easier to to actually do the work. Awesome. Okay, then. So we'll just round up there. Um, thank you, Jeffrey and School, for talking with us today. It's been excellent. It's been really great to hear your viewpoints on how to tackle some of these challenges that have been raised today. Uh, you can connect with us. Links in the chat. I just want to note that there's lots of free resources on the conversationaltransformation.com website. So I encourage you to go there, join the mailing list, buy the book if you want to, um, but uh, get more on these uh, topics and you can find more, lots more resources uh, there. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that website's fantastic. It's got lots of information, including the podcasts. And obviously, you can connect with uh, Jeffrey and Squirrel on the LinkedIn's they've got here. And uh, don't forget to check out uh, conference.ctocraft.com for the conference that's coming up at the beginning of December. So thank you all for joining us today and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you very much.